Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session on the BSc in Computer Science program being offered by Bits Bilani. Thank you for taking the time out on a weekend and being here with us. We really appreciate that. We are glad to see the amount of interest that this program has generated. And uh, the high amount of interest is matched by a lot of questions as well. Uh, so which is why we are having this webinar uh, to address these questions and uh, even before the start of the program. All right. So at the end of this uh, and at the end of this uh, presentation, we'll be having a live Q&A session. Uh, so we'd love to hear from you. Please post your queries in the Q&A box, which is available uh, in, the, in the Zoom meeting. And we'll take all your questions and answer them at the end of the session. And at any point, in case you miss anything or if uh, somebody joins late, don't worry about it. This meeting is being recorded and it will be shared with you as soon as the recording is available to everyone. So uh, my name is Ajit Punjal. Uh, I've been working at uh, BITS since uh, 2012, uh, mainly in the IT and operations uh, areas. Uh, for this program, I'm going to be the program manager and uh, I'm going to be handling the uh, non-academic uh, elements and aspects related to operations, policies and procedures. I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter, uh, Professor Vimal SP. He is the program coordinator for the BSc in Computer Science program. And he has been associated with BITS as a faculty in the Computer Science Department uh, for the last 17 years. Uh, he has led the, uh, or basically he's the lead curriculum designer for this program. And uh, he has worked extensively with a large team of academics as well as uh, industry professionals. And uh, he is the best person to share the details of this program with you. All right, so let's quickly look at uh, what we'll be covering in today's session. Uh, so Professor Vimal will first give you an introduction to Bits Pilani, and then he will explain the various aspects of the uh, BSc uh, in computer science program, such as the objectives, the program structure, the pedagogy, etc. And uh, once that is completed, uh, I'll take over the presentation. I'll also look at some of the operational aspects uh, of your application and other non-academic uh, policies, uh, which will be covered, basically your eligibility, the fee structure, things like that. And once our presentations are done, which should take approximately about uh, 30 minutes, then we will have a Q&A session in the second half of this program, which will last for approximately 60 minutes. So. If you have any questions, please post it in there. Uh, we're monitoring the Q&A box. And since uh, there are many participants, you may have questions that are repeating. Uh, so we will try to uh, combine all the questions together, which are similar and try to give answers. We're going to try to answer all the questions that we can. All right. And in case we miss something, uh, there's, we'll provide you an email address. You can also post your specific queries there and we'll answer it there as well. Okay, uh, so without further ado, I'd like to uh, request Professor Wimmel to take over and uh, continue the presentation. Professor Wimmel, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ajit, for the introduction and thank you, Kostra, for organizing this meeting. Hope you can hear me well. Um, it's a very warm noon here in Bangalore. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you're all doing well. A warm welcome to each and everyone uh, who's joined this call. It's a pleasure to be here and share details about the degree program, BSc in Computer Science being offered through Coursera. So what I actually plan to do in the next 20 to 30 minutes are the following. One is a brief introduction about Bits Pilani, and then I would introduce the program BSc in Computer Science with details like the courses, program structures, pedagogy, and so on, right? 
So let's actually begin with uh, bits, bits Pilani. Let me first take you through a journey of Birla Institute of Technology and Science, Pilani, in short, uh, Bits Pilani. Pilani is a small desert village in Rajasthan. It's a birthplace of a founder chairman, um, late Sri uh, GT Birla. It all started with one um, teacher, one teacher school uh, known as Patsala in 1901. Okay, 1901. So the school evolved into high school, intermediate college, degree college, postgraduate college between 1901 to 1950. And uh, the courses were offered uh, early uh, in the early days were science, arts, commerce, and pharmacy. And then later in 1952, uh, there were formal colleges, Birla College of Arts, Birla College of Science, Commerce, and Pharmacy. By 1964, uh, all the constituent uh, institutes were merged and uh, programs on electrical, mechanical, civil, chemical and were introduced. And then Bits Pilani came into being and was declared as deemed to be university uh, established under Section 3 of UGC Act, India, Government of India. Right? So that's a long story uh, short. The institute has four campuses one at Pilani, uh, Dubai. Uh, in 2000, uh, we started the campus. And there's one campus in Goa in 2004. And there's one campus in Hyderabad in 2008. And uh, Bits Pilani is an institute with long legacy in education. Uh, next slide. Uh, I know you'll have a lot of questions. I, I request you to please please wait until the session is over, and the, uh, until the talk is over, and then we'll take up your questions. Okay. So in 2018, Bits Pilani was declared as Institute of Eminence. Bitspilani is one of the first six institutions that the government of India recognized as Institute of Eminence. This is one of the highest honor uh, for an academic institutions in India. So uh, Bitspilani has significant presence across India with uh, three campuses respectively in uh, Pilani, Goa and Hyderabad in India, a management institute in Mumbai, a campus in Dubai, work integrated learning programs in which the students are all working professional with close to 35,000 on roll and uh, 98,000 uh, as its alumni. The four campuses having an alumni network of 65,000 graduates of whom about, of whom, uh, about 10 percentage are CEOs, 10 percentage are founders and 5 percentage are senior academicians and nine unicorns, right? So you can actually see that a significant percentage of uh, our alumni are uh, well accomplished, which is a matter of pride to be with here. The Institute is also ranked high in QS and other ratings. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, the agenda for the next 20 minutes. Uh, next slide. Next. Right. So the demand for uh, Skill manpower and computing is growing due to the changes uh, or growth in software in associated industries. Okay, the skill gap between the fresh graduates and the industry requirements is acknowledged by the industry. There's a huge skill gap and there's a short of manpower. This program being offered through Coursera addresses works to address these gaps, uh, bringing in its Pilani's expertise uh, in offering high quality degree programs. The entry level positions in software industry, such as application software developers, system software developer, system programmer, web programmer, computer programmer, network, uh, uh, sorry, database application developer, and so on, uh, requires kind of skills that are met by graduates of an undergraduate program effectively. Okay, we're confident this program will enable graduates to meet these requirements uh, for these job, job roles. This is a three-year degree program with six semesters, and each semester has uh, each year has got two semesters. Um, in each semester, the program has about six courses. The six courses in the semester can be taken in two shorter terms in a way that the students need to focus only on smaller number of courses at a given time. Right? I'll show you the details of these as we go on. The program has a fair mix of courses from foundational to advanced topics. You can see that the discipline courses in the program are largely uh, from the knowledge or skill areas, 
uh, like application development, systems and systems programming, database and analytics, algorithmics and theoretical computer science. The program has two types of courses, uh, which are mandatory, right? Uh, one is um, the core course, uh, a foundational course. The other one is disciplinary course, right? So there are core courses and disciplinary courses. Okay, so there are certain core courses which are mandatory, and certain uh, certain 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 of them are electives, and there are certain disciplinary courses which are mandatory, and certain of them are electives. Okay, um, and then there are two projected courses. Okay, these two projected courses are offered the third year. Over three years, you will complete uh, about uh, the minimum of 107 units. In each semester, there will be a coursework of about 18 units. Just divide uh, 107 by six, uh, it, it comes about one zero, uh, sorry, one, uh, 18, okay? So there are certain semesters you would actually see that, uh, uh, you, you will see certain semesters with 17 or 18 units, or rarely some semesters will have you know 19 units. So it will be about 18 units by and large. The program also provides an intermediate exit option at the end of two years. I'll talk about the details of an intermediate exit towards the end of the presentation. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next slide, Ajit. Bitsplan is an institution with very strong industry connection. Our internal surveys and many other um, open reports points to things as I mentioned earlier, the demand for software professionals at, uh, professionals are growing at a faster pace, and there is a concern in the employability of uh, fresh graduates with skill gap, right? With, with, with uh, found with fresh graduates. The primary objectives of this program, uh, keeping in mind uh, this, are the following. One, uh, to provide conceptual and analytical uh, understanding uh, to the pervasive presence or role of computing and software in the modern world. Second one is uh, to provide strong foundation in software development with adequate working knowledge with broad areas, uh, broad basics in computer, computer science. Further, the program enables uh, graduates to pursue further study or specialization in domains like software engineering, data science, high performance computing, and algorithms. The disciplinary courses, uh, that's both core and elective courses, are appropriately chosen to emphasize uh, that the knowledge areas in computer science uh, um, are stressed appropriately to ensure employability, particularly the entry level jobs for sure. Um, the positions like uh, Software programmer, application developer, web application developer, mobile application developer, software programmer, software system programmer, network programmer, or some of the job roles that the program objectives are aiming at, in addition to enabling the candidates uh, to be able to pursue higher studies uh, as they require. The major outcome, outcome of the program is this, that uh, the graduate should be a versatile software developer, with exposure and adequate knowledge of one or more sub, uh, software subdomains uh, and basics in computing. Let's actually look at the uh, program structure in detail, and we'll talk about how this program structure uh, aligns with our objective and the expected outcome. Next slide. The program has a mix of different kinds of courses like foundational courses, disciplinary courses, project type courses. Certain courses are made mandatory in both foundation and disciplinary courses and certain courses are made as selectors. There are two project type courses uh, in the program called as uh, study project and project. Next few slides, let me show you the list of courses in each category. Uh, next slide. What you see are uh, courses under humanities uh, foundation courses. The course writing uh, writing practice is mandatory for all the students. You will actually be doing this course in the first semester of your uh, degree program. And there are two other courses which are actually listed, uh, which are online social media and video games, technology and social impacts. Um, these two other courses, uh, which are which are uh, to be. Uh, done under humanities but you will actually have to do only one of them and uh, one of them and you'll have to pick one of these these two courses either online social media or video games 
technology and social impacts. Right? The next one is uh, mathematical foundation courses. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So the mathematical foundation courses are probability and statistics, discrete mathematics, introduction to logic, uh, linear algebra and optimization. These, these, these four are uh, mathematical foundation courses and all these courses are actually mandatory. Uh, the course discrete mathematics comes in the very first semester itself, uh, comes in the very first semester itself and linear algebra comes in the very first semester. Um, you actually can see that uh, the course, uh, the courses uh, have, a, uh, have a good balance between uh, the theory and then the applications particularly when you actually do a discrete mathematics course in the very first semester, you would actually be talking about uh, their applications to computer science um, in everything that you actually study, right? Introduction to logic is, is, is a course which is pretty core to uh, mathematics, but then there's actually a very fundamental course uh, in, in programming too, right? So these are uh, mathematical foundation courses that everyone has to do. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are the courses which actually comes under science and science or engineering foundation courses. Uh, the course basic electronics is, is mandatory for all of all, this, all the students. Uh, the second course uh, under uh, science and engineering foundation um, should be one of general physics and general biology. Okay. The next slide. The other foundation courses, the other foundation courses that are actually uh, part of the program are one, uh, an environmental studies courses. This is mandatory for uh, for all the students. And uh, the second course will be one of introduction to economics, uh, introduction to economics, science, technology, and uh, modernity. And uh, one of these courses would be the second course. Right. Um, basic question, can we actually take both physics and biology? Um, it's not possible. Right? It's not possible. Only one of uh, these courses can be picked. That's, that's what the structure enables. Can you go to the next slide? So what you actually see now is a list of uh, disciplinary courses, disciplinary core courses, right? This list is a little long. Let me share uh, a few words about this list of courses. Uh, sorry about that. I think he's having some technical issues with his internet. Um, we'll just wait a minute in case he's able to join back. Um, yeah, he just messaged me that he's joining back in a minute. So uh, I'm also seeing a lot of questions being posted in the chat window. Uh, please make sure that you post your queries in the Q&A window. There's another window uh, next to the chat. So the questions will be picked up from the Q&A window and at the end of the session, we will try to answer them. Okay, so please post it in the Q&A window.
welcome back professor vimal sorry there was a, a connection problem uh, i'll actually start with the uh, disciplinary core courses again uh, so uh, what you see in this slide uh, is a list of disciplinary core courses meaning that all these courses are mandatory and these courses are actually uh, forming the core of uh, bsc in computer science degree program structure okay um, the course uh, introduction to programming data structures and algorithms command line interfaces uh, and scripting algorithm design object oriented programming formal languages and applications covers uh, the theoretical and practical aspects of programming and programming languages right? the course uh, formal languages and applications are a classic course introducing formal languages but when it actually gets getting concrete uh, you have a course like uh, introduction to programming where you actually be learning c programming and you would actually be learning uh, how to develop a program uh, how to develop a program with data structures and how to design algorithms how to design algorithms how to compare algorithms okay and then you actually would learn about uh, a different paradigm of programming like object oriented programming and then you would actually be learning about command line interfaces um, how to do scripting and so on so so the course is introduction to programming dsa command line interface and scripting algorithm design object oriented programming these these courses Are, are around programming and programming languages. If you just look at the next set of courses, okay, I'm just picking from this uh, list. Uh, the course like introduction to computing systems, computer systems, and performance, right? Operating systems, network programming, and client-server programming uh, introduces uh, introduces the learners about uh, about uh, the computer systems, system software, and programming the system. right the course is relational databases building uh, database applications so again mandatory which which introduces you to the world of database uh, building database applications right um, and there are other courses uh, like software design principles and software development practices that these two courses talks about the current industry practices in developing a software okay uh, and again um, there are there are a list of courses Uh, which are uh, which are which are more hands on based uh, network programming class of programming uh, programming for mobile devices web programming uh, are the lines of systems and application uh, programming themes i must tell you that these these courses will be rigorous and engaging with various self learning materials uh, practice problems and such okay uh, now let me look into uh, the list of uh, disciplinary elective courses Uh, the next slide right the courses that you see in this slide are disciplinary elective courses you have the freedom to choose the courses that aligns with your interest there are 12 courses in this list and in your program structure i'll show you the structure in a while uh, there are options to choose four electives from this list so discipline elective 1 so in that structure i would actually mark it as discipline elective 1 discipline elective 2 discipline elective 3 discipline elective 4 okay so you can substitute any of these courses against this discipline electives in each semester we will offer three to four courses from the list uh from which you can actually choose uh, your discipline elective the courses in this list are carefully chosen to enable uh, students to advance their uh, knowledge in the fields of their interest for example for example uh, students who are, who are, who are who are interested to work in the field of analytics will actually find the course introduction to data analytics and data visualization quite useful because the students would have actually done the course uh, mandatory course on you know databases uh, uh, creating database applications and so on Uh, as as it's a mandatory course and then the course these two courses can actually add value to it right the students who actually want to extend their uh, knowledge or skills on systems will find the course multi core cp cp programming and tcp ip uh, internet interesting courses not just this uh, right so students who actually want to learn more on uh, 
theoretical aspects of computer science, we'll actually find the course graph, graphs and networks, automata and computability, experimental algorithm makes interesting. The course graphs and networks, uh, uh, graphs and networks is elements of network science which are necessary to model uh, real networks like your Facebook. Okay, so this course actually has has those introduction too. So these courses uh, together have a right blend of theory and practices that suits the nature of uh, uh, the learning requirement. Let's now look at uh, the project type courses uh, in the, the next slide. Uh, Ajit, please. Right. Right, so here is a project uh, type course. There are two project type courses in the curriculum. The first one is called a study project. The second one is called as just project, okay? Both these courses are, are offered in the third year of your degree program. So in third year, there are two semesters, semester one and semester two. In the, the first semester of third year, you have the course study project, okay? In the second semester of your third year, you have the course project. The study project is a five credit course. The project is a 10 credit course. These two courses, uh, these two courses together enables uh, you, to, uh, you to have a hands-on uh, in, in solving a fairly larger uh, software development problem, software development problem, okay? In the study project course, let me actually talk about each of these courses separately. One is a study project course, which is a five credit course in third year, first semester. The students are expected to carry out an organized study and identify a problem which requires a software solution. Okay. You would actually be working in a group. Students also study the impacts of solving the problem and existing solutions. And at the end of this uh, study project, uh, you're expected to submit a report with project proposal, details of background, scope and solution methodology, um, detailing requirement specifications. Right? And you will actually take this proposal and you will go on to your uh, second semester, third year, that's a project course. And you would go on uh, producing a software solution to the problem that you actually have identified in the previous semester. Okay, so students will uh, work to produce a software solution to the problem whose requirements were studied and documented in the study project course. The students will uh, demonstrate uh, their work and submit the detailed project report at the end of the semester. So these two courses are very important. Uh, as I said, they provide uh, an experience of working on a larger, find a reasonably larger uh, computer project. Uh, next slide, please. So in this slide, I've listed down the academic areas, the themes, uh, and the courses that actually falls. So uh, this table has got four rows. Each row has a name of a track and the core courses in the program that actually falls into the track and elective courses uh, that actually falls into the track. So look at the first, first row. The courses listed under a uh, thread uh, or a track application development enables the learners to apply software development principles and practices to develop a full stack application. Okay, so, so it has got all the uh, necessary core courses uh, and then you actually can choose elective courses uh, as you feel like extending your knowledge. The second row um, has courses under systems and systems programming. Uh, this track enables the learners to effectively uh, leverage uh, features of core computer systems, for example, knowledge of computer architecture, operating systems, computer networks, and uh, leverage it uh, in building a system software. Right? So the other courses uh, which are which are under uh, electives uh, advances uh, the knowledge and skills in this particular subject area. The next row, uh, databases and data analytics. The courses in this row enables learners to use data computationally uh, for and build uh, data centric applications using traditional and modern databases. Uh, the sense structured, unstructured, semi structured data with, with, with structured, unstructured, and semi structured data. 
the courses under algorithmic theoretical computers computer science uh, enables learner uh, enables a learner uh, to obtain an appreciation uh, and basic understanding of theoretical, theoretical computer science as well as applying algorithm design techniques to solve problems efficiently right so you have options to choose four electives and i'm sure you can actually pick your electives uh, to to extend your knowledge on the on the, on, the, on the chosen uh, tracks that you would like to uh, uh, learn more the 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 term tracks uh, only uh, means uh, to characterize the program better. You can actually see that uh, the, the set of core courses and elective courses actually comes from these four tracks. Uh, so, so if you just look at this program this particular way, it will actually be helpful for you to understand uh, your, your progress better, that you are you're learning better, and then you, you can actually uh, assess your learning also better. Right. So the names of these tracks will not appear in any degree certificates. This is only to characterize the kind of courses that that, that makes up the degree program. OK. Um, next slide. OK, finally. What you actually see is a semester wise structure of the program. OK. Uh, if you just look at uh, if you just look at the first semester, uh, there are six courses listed: Introduction to Programming, Discrete Mathematics, Linear Algebra and Optimization, Introduction to Computing Systems, and Basic Electronics. Basic Electronics and Writing Practice. So these are these are these are courses actually listed under first semester. And similarly, there are courses that are listed under each of uh, each of the semesters. Okay. Uh, each of the semesters. And you can actually see that at the end of uh, uh, each of semesters, uh, we actually mark the number of units that you would actually accumulate. Okay, so in second semester, you have set of core courses. When I say core courses, the core actually could come from both foundation and discipline. Okay, so if you just look at the second semester, data structures and algorithms, objective -oriented programming, command line interface and scripting are actually coming from uh, Disciplinary course, PropStat comes from Mathematical Foundation. Introduction to Logic comes from uh, uh, Mathematical Foundation. And there's one option to have uh, a foundation elective course. Right? So this is how the structure looks like. And the units in each semester uh, is around 18, 19, or in, in a particular case, it's actually 16 to uh, sorry 17 to 19 in the third year for semester and the third year second semester is actually from 16 to 17 that that range actually means uh, that if you actually pick an elective uh, course of a higher credit the, the the unit that you actually accumulate may actually go up slightly okay slightly and you can actually see that your discipline elective first discipline elective comes at the end of second year and then there are two discipline electives at the at the uh, third year first semester, and there's one discipline elective at the third year um, second semester. Okay. Uh, next slide, and you can see that uh, uh, there is a uh, project course in the third year first semester, third year second semester, right? Study project and project. You can actually see the place. Okay, next slide, please. So you have you have seen the semester wise uh, structure of the program a while back, uh, sorry, the previous slide. Uh, in, in each semester, we have six courses except uh, the semesters in the third year. To help learners to focus only on a limited number of courses at a given time, what we do is to split the courses into two groups, three courses each, and offer these courses uh, in two terms. Okay. For instance, there are six courses in the first semester with a total of 18, 18 units. Uh, in the first half of the first semester, you will only be focusing on first three courses and the rest during the second half. 
the half this, this half a semester uh, where you do a subset of courses is notionally called as a term, right? So officially, you know, uh, our program structure consisting of semesters, terms are uh, introduced to ensure that you have uh, only a limited number of courses to focus at any given time. Um, what you actually have now is uh, the semester-wise structure uh, for the entire degree program, right? Now for the first semester, I've actually shown you that this is how the first term courses and second term courses will go. Similarly, uh, the courses uh, that goes into the first term or first half of the semester and second half of the semester will be informed to you ahead of the time you actually registered uh, for the semester, okay? Uh, Ajit will give you the details of registration and such uh, in his talk. Next slide. This is a three-year uh, program and each year has got two semesters. Uh, next slide and next slide, twice. <laughs> Ajit. Yeah. Uh, again, one more thing. <laughs> Right. So you can actually see that a semester has got two terms. A semester has uh, uh, two terms. Uh, the length of each semester is about 26 weeks with about 22 weeks of classwork and the remaining time is actually spent in breaks and uh, evaluations and so on. Okay. Evaluations and so on. Uh, for each course, there are about nine to 10 weeks of classwork. And uh, I said uh, for each uh, term, two weeks are earmarked for evaluation purposes, where we actually conduct a proctored examination. Okay. Um, in a particular week, you will have about twenty-five hours of uh, twenty-five hours of uh, learning uh, involved. This is just an estimate that includes all the required effect, uh, all the required efforts uh, from the learner. There will be about six hours of video lectures per week. Okay, this includes the video lectures for all the courses. So that is to say that roughly there are about two hours of video lectures per course. Okay, roughly there are about two hours of video lectures per course. Um, this can actually vary with the, the units of the course, uh, with the nature of the particular module for the particular week. Sometimes it can actually go all the come all the way down to an hour, and then there will be a slight increase. Uh, so the number is an average number, okay? While the instructors develop the material, video lectures and other materials, they keep in mind uh, the, the learning requirement from the learner and the effort uh, required from the learner. And we also ensure that there's a fair balance, uh, fair balance of effort expected from the students over the semester, right? So. Out of this 24, 25 hours uh, learning effort, we said about six hours, uh, about six hours will be consumed in actually viewing the video lectures or consuming the materials there in the video lectures. The remaining hours are expected to be spent by solving practice problems, completing uh, assigned readings, working on assignments, answering quizzes, and so on, other activities, right? Uh, there will be a few live online live sessions with the faculty for each course. Okay, about at least two, at least two uh, would be there uh, and could go all the way to four uh, sessions per course. So during these sessions, you will be directly interacting with the instructors of the course. Uh, the agenda schedule uh, for these sessions will be announced uh, by the concerned instructor by the concerned instructor at the beginning of the courses, okay? For example, if the instructor actually feels like having a live session uh, at this particular point, explaining certain things could actually be helpful or interacting with the students could actually be helpful, the instructor would, would actually make a plan. So this actually, this the judgment actually goes with the uh, course to course, okay? So we attempt to provide all the learning material necessary for the course. The material in most cases uh, are self-contained. In certain places, there's nothing like reading a page or two from the textbooks, right? Uh, we don't want uh, the rigor of learning from the textbooks is not missed. 
uh, all together by simply watching video lectures. So we prescribe textbooks for all the courses and uh, there would be uh, readings as from, from time to time that the teachers assigns to students, uh, uh, learners, and I'm sure uh, you will appreciate this in the interest of learning. Um, next slide. Right. So uh, let me actually uh, take you through uh, key aspects of the pedagogy. One is there are two project type courses. In these courses, the learners will work in a small team, identifying and solving a problem and documenting it. Right. And we enable learners to collaborate with their fellow classmates through technology, uh, Slack, discussion forums, and forums, and etc. Uh, there are live sessions for each course. You will interact directly with your instructor during the sessions. So you would actually be interacting with your fellow classmates and your teachers during the during the course uh, during the course. Okay, uh, we have a large pool of instructors who are attached with each course who will monitor your request for support and be assured that your concerns will be addressed at the quickest possible time or your request for clarification, such uh, aspects would be answered at the quickest possible time. The Kosra lab infrastructure, our Kosra labs and the lab infrastructure at Bitspilani campuses will be used appropriately in the courses to ensure adequate hands-on uh, learning experience. There will be a proctored, uh, there will be a proctored exam at the, at the end of each course. We call this exam as a comprehensive examination. So there is a comprehensive examination for each course at the end of, uh, at the, end of uh, the course. This will be a proctored exam. And the uh, weightage of this proctored exam is about 50%. And uh, during the progress, during the, during the course uh, time, there would be a lot of grade, graded quizzes. We'll ensure that uh, there's the right uh, level of uh, quizzes set for each courses. And there are assignments. Uh, sometimes it could actually be programming assignments. Sometimes it could actually be pen and paper assignments. This is about 20 percentage. This number is tentative, right? There could be minor differences depending on the nature of courses. Nature of courses. For example, if there's a if there's a particular course where uh, a lot of aspects of programming uh, or problem solving has to be tested through assignments, there could be slight increase there in the assignment, and then there could be uh, changes there. The other components, right? So in case if there are any changes, it will be announced to you in the beginning of the semester so that so that things are pretty uh, clear to both you and the teacher. Next slide. The program actually provides an intermediate exit option at the end of two years. The intermediate exit comes with a diploma in software development. It comes with a diploma in its software development. And uh, if you just look at uh, the, the structure for uh, diploma and software development. Uh, the first two years are exactly the same as your BSc. So if at the end of the second year, for certain personal reasons, you would like to take an intermediate exit, you will have to inform us. We would actually let you know the processes involved in these aspects. Then you will actually have to complete a short a project course, register for a short project course, and then um, you can actually leave uh, with with the diploma and software development. So this is an option in case if you actually find, uh, you actually have a reason to, to take the exit. Right, so uh, I've come to the end of my presentation and I'm about to uh, leave the dice for Mr. Ajit. Uh, I would like to take a few, uh, a very few questions before I do that. And I would actually answer most of your questions towards the end of the session. Um, let me just open Q and A and see if there's any immediate question. There's one or two questions. I'll take it up, and then I'll actually hand it over to Ajita. 
Ajit has two minutes. Yeah, what absolutely. Grade, no problem. What grading system will be applied? None then. Relative grading system, that's as that's what Pets uses always. Um, how will the exam will uh, be taken? This will be a proctored online examination. We will share the details of the technology involved uh, shortly. Is this recording be shared? Um, I hope yes, Ajit. Yes, yes, it will be shared at the end of this session with all the registered parts. Right. So there are certain um, operational questions. For example, may I uh, please ask when the decision be made on acceptance? Um, you will get an answer shortly in the, in the next talk by Ajit. Thank you everyone for patient hearing and uh, Ajit is over to you. Thank you, Professor Vimal, for a very comprehensive explanation of the uh, academic aspects of this program. Uh, so it's back to me again. All right. So let's look at some of the non-academic aspects of this program. All right. So uh, for all the applicants, um, what is it that we are looking for uh, as eligibility criteria to join this program and to, uh, to be able to? Uh, so we're looking at uh, people. Uh, the eligibility criteria basically uh, is used to ensure that the students can participate, understand and complete it uh, successfully. So we only have three criteria here. The first criteria is whether uh, you have completed a class 12th or equivalent uh, exam, a high school exam. Uh, and if you have that qualification from a recognized board, that's the first criteria. The second criteria is um, whether you have uh, adequate knowledge of English, since this program is completely designed and is being conducted uh, in the English language, we want to make sure that you'll, you'll be able to understand and participate and successfully complete the program. And the third criteria is whether you have a basic knowledge of the mathematics required uh, for the uh, uh, BSc in computer science program. This is a since this is a computer science program, uh, we are endeavoring to uh, basically uh, have all the math related content. A lot of the math related content that is required for this program is a part of this curriculum already, as Professor Vimal has uh, explained to you. Uh, however, there are certain basic prerequisites of mathematics which will be required. So that is one of the eligibility criteria. So these are the three eligibility criteria that we're looking for from all applicants, both uh, from Indians, uh, Indian uh, applicants, as well as from the uh, international applicants. So specifically for the uh, Indian applications, um, uh, for the Indian applicants, uh, you should have passed your class 12th examination uh, in any stream uh, from a recognized uh, central or state board. All right, so that is the first criteria for Indian uh, students. And if you have studied English as a subject uh, up to your class 10th, then we will consider you uh, as meeting the requirements of the English proficiency. So please note that it is English as a subject. We are not saying that you have to have studied in the English medium. We just need you to have studied English as one of the subjects up to your class 10th for Indian students. So if you meet this criteria, then you're eligible uh, from the uh, English proficiency requirement. The final criteria is for your uh, mathematics proficiency. And in your class 12th examination, if you have studied mathematics and if you have scored 60% or higher, then you are eligible uh, from the mathematics uh, proficiency criteria. All right. So in case you've not taken mathematics in your class 12th, or if you have uh, taken mathematics, but you've not uh, secured 60%, if your score is less than 60%, uh, in that case also, we are not stopping you from joining. Uh, 
uh, you'll be asked to write a maths qualifier examination, which is going to be conducted by Bits Pilani. And if you meet the minimum uh, qualifying criteria in the uh, exam, then you'll be deemed eligible to uh, uh, join the program. All right, so these are the three uh, criteria for the Indian students. The same criteria basically will apply uh, for the international applicants as well. However, there is a slight variation in how we assess uh, the qualifications or the documents because uh, across the applications from various countries, we are seeing a lot of variations in the types of documents and uh, certificates that are provided to us. So again, we are saying that uh, the applicant should have uh, cleared their class 12th or the high school uh, qualification from the respective country's board. All right. And the, uh, so how do we know that this is equivalent to the class 12th from Indian boards? So there is an organization called the Association of Indian Universities. And they are empowered to basically uh, issue an equivalent certificate for foreign uh, qualifications from foreign boards or from uh, foreign universities. So once, you're, uh, once you apply and if you receive the provisional admission offer, you will be required to provide the AIU equivalent certificate uh, for your qualifying examination, your qualifying high school uh, examination. So this is only for the international applicants. And this certificate does not need to be provided right now at the time of applying. It's only after you receive the provisional admission offer. Okay. Uh, for your English proficiency, uh, if the medium of instruction uh, up to your high school was in English, then you are uh, considered eligible to apply. So many certificates uh, of the high school qualifications will mention that the, uh, uh, the language of instruction or the medium of instruction is English. In case this is not mentioned on your high school uh, certificate or high school qualification, then you are requested to provide uh, a certificate from your school or your board mentioning that uh, English was the primary medium of instruction. So that supporting documentation will be required. Now, in case uh, you do not have this, if, if, the, if English was not the medium of instruction in your high school, or if you're not able to provide this particular certificate, you have an alternate option. Uh, you can write uh, either the IELTS or the TOEFL or the online uh, Duolingo English test, any of these. And uh, you can submit your score from that, uh, from either of these exams. And if you meet, uh, if you, if you meet the passing criteria, so for IELTS, you need to score a band six or higher. For uh, the TOEFL, you need to score 60 plus on the internet-based test. And for the Duolingo English test, your score should be above 90. So if you meet this criteria, we will uh, consider you as uh, eligible to apply uh, uh, from the English proficiency uh, criteria. Now coming to the mathematics uh, criteria, again, it's the same uh, we're looking at. Uh, if, if you've taken uh, mathematics at your high school or class 12th level, and if you've scored uh, more than 60%, uh, you're considered eligible from the mathematics proficiency criteria. Uh, and in case you've not taken mathematics in your class 12, or if you fail to secure 60% uh, uh, or uh, if it is a grade point calculation in your uh, board or school, if you've scored uh, less than six out of 10 on a scale of 10, uh, that means you're not uh, meeting the criteria. In that case, uh, you will have to write the mathematics qualifier examination to qualify. 
All right. So the way this works is uh, once you apply, uh, our admissions team will review your applications. And if we find that uh, you're lacking in the mathematics proficiency, if your scores are not uh, being met, we will send you an uh, in invitation to register for your mathematics uh, qualified examination. So you can register for that and uh, you can pay the fees and uh, write the exam. The next slot for the mathematics examination is on November 19th. So you have uh, plenty of time to uh, practice for that. It is not a hard exam. It is basically going to test uh, uh, basic concepts, uh, basic prerequisites that are required for the program. Uh, one more thing I'd like to mention at this point for international applicants, uh, you will also need to submit a copy of your uh, valid passport. Uh, but again, this is not required at the time of application. So once you receive your provisional admission offer, uh, you will have to submit your a copy of your passport. So in case you do not have your passport with you right now, uh, you can submit any other national ID it could be your driving license uh, or anything which is uh, considered as a national photo id uh, which is uh, given to you by your country's government however you will need to provide your passport to us before the end of the year before 31st december you will need to uh, submit a copy of your passport all right to continue with the program All right. So coming to the uh, fee structure for this program. So depending on uh, your citizenship or uh, so for purposes of uh, citizenship, we're going to look at what passports you're going to have. I think that's the best way to determine your citizenship. Uh, so for example, you could be an Indian citizen holding an Indian passport, but you might be working in the US or Europe or any other country on a work visa or something. But if you have an Indian passport, you can apply as an Indian citizen. Uh, there could be some Indian citizens who have gone outside and uh, they've changed their passport. They've become uh, citizens of other countries, in which case, uh, whichever passport, whichever valid passport they're holding currently, that would be their citizenship. Okay, so the tuition fee is going to vary depending on your the citizenship of the applicant. So if you are an Indian passport holder, if you're a citizen of India, then uh, your tuition fee is going to be uh, 3 lakh 13,000 rupees. This is the cost for the entire program. And this is, uh, you need to pay it uh, semester wise. So this is split across six semesters into equal installments. And at the beginning of every semester, you are expected to make the semester fee payment. Okay, and so uh, from semester one through semester six, in each semester you will be paying uh, rupees fifty two thousand one sixty seven. Now there are about uh, eighty four countries which have been uh, selected based on certain macroeconomic parameters by the institute, and uh, for these countries. Uh, the tuition fee has been, uh, we've given a special fee uh, for the reasons uh, mentioned earlier, the, uh, based on the macroeconomic parameters. And the tuition fee for these, the students from these countries is $4,000. Again, this is going to be split across uh, the six semesters of the program. So in each semester, students from these countries will pay $667 for each semester. Now students from all other countries uh, will have to pay $6,000 as the tuition fee for the entire program and split across uh, each of the semesters, it will be $1,000 per semester. The normal duration of this program is three years and we encourage you to complete it 
as per the normal duration as per the normal plan uh, however you also have the flexibility to complete this program in up to six years depending on what uh, circumstances uh, you have okay so you can either take breaks in between semesters or uh, within a given semester you can take fewer courses to learn at a slower pace uh, so these options are available to you and uh, so some if you if you uh, decide to uh, slow your pace or take breaks there could be certain implications in your fee structure so the fee structure that we are showing over here is uh, representative for a 3 year program if you complete the uh, program in 3 years then this is what will apply if you're going to take breaks or if you're going to slow your pace and take lesser courses and stretch out um, the program over a longer period of time crossing three years, then there could be additional uh, payments involved. So let's look at some of these scenarios. Okay, so the first case is taking a break between semesters. So if you do, uh, you may do a couple of semesters and then you may say, I'm gonna take a break of one semester and then I'm gonna resume uh, the semester after that. So that is allowed to, you're allowed to do that. You can take, students are allowed to take uh, breaks in between semesters. And there's going to be no additional fee implication, uh, which basically means that you can take up to two semester breaks in the program and you will not have to pay any other additional fees other than the one which I've shown you earlier. So you should be able to complete this program within four years. So if you take two semester breaks, you'll be, if you follow the same semester wise pattern, you'll be able to complete it within four years. If you do that, there's no additional fee implication. However, if uh, for various reasons, if you take more than two semester breaks, then you will not be able to complete it in four years. So it is going to go beyond that. And in that case, for or any pending semester beyond four years, when you register for that semester, you will have to pay the fees uh, which is specified for that year. So in that given year, when we do new student admissions, we will indicate what is the uh, semester fees for that particular year. And whatever is the fees that is prevailing at that time, you will have to pay the semester that amount, not the amount which we have mentioned here in the previous slide. Okay. And the breaks can only be taken between semesters. So once you complete one semester, you can choose not to register for the next one. So that would be counted as a break. All right. So uh, while you can take a break in between. So if a semester is active right now, if you take a break in between, uh, you can do that if, uh, if you have uh, extenuating circumstances. But if you do that, you're going to forfeit the semester fee that you've paid. And you will have to re-register for that same semester again. So uh, try not to do that. So try to complete a semester and take the break after that. The maximum number of courses uh, in any given semester will be, uh, so six, six courses are anyway there. So depending on other circumstances, if you have to take extra courses, if there's, uh, if that requirement comes in the university, the institute will decide uh, whether you can take extra courses. And you are expected to complete this program in a maximum duration of six years. You cannot exceed uh, beyond six years. You have to complete all your requirements and attempt finish your graduation before six years. So that's the maximum uh, criteria. The other option that you may choose to uh, explore is to do fewer courses in a given semester. So instead of six courses in a semester, you may say, I'll only do three courses or four courses. Uh, so that flexibility is also available to you. Uh, however, if you uh, choose that option, you may not be able to complete uh, the program within the normal duration of three years. Uh, and if you take an additional year, so if, if you s slow your pace and then you whatever pending courses are remaining, if you're able to complete that within four years, there is no additional fee implication. So whatever fees I've showed you in the first slide, you'll be under the same uh, fee structure as long as you complete the program within four years. 
Now, in case you're not able to complete within four years, if you still have pending courses after four years, then you will have to pay a per course fee for all of the pending courses or projects that are uh, the, that you're registering for in a given semester. And this per course fee will typically be about 17 to 20% of the semester fee. Uh, so if you have two courses left after four years, you'll have to pay a per course fee for each of the two courses. If you have three courses left, you'll have to pay it for each of that. Again, the maximum number of courses in a semester will be determined by the uh, Institute. And uh, you are still expected to complete the program in a maximum duration of six years. Under any circumstances, under all circumstances, you're supposed to complete it within six years to graduate. Now, there may be uh, certain cases where you're not able to meet the minimum qualifying marks. So the criteria to graduate from the program is you need to have a minimum CGPA of 4.5 uh, at the end of your program. When you complete all your courses and projects, you should have a CGPA of 4.5. So in case you're not able to meet this criteria, suppose uh, uh, your CGPA is below 4.5, then you may have to pick certain courses where you have scored less and retake those courses to get a higher score. So your CGPA will go above 4.5. All right. So in uh, these kind of situations, again, uh, you'll have to register for the uh, courses uh, in the semester and pay an additional course fee, which is uh, uh, 17 to 20% of the semester fee for that particular academic year. And again, you're expected to complete the program in a maximum duration of six years. Uh, one more scenario, uh, which Professor Vimal has also discussed uh, with you is to exit with a diploma at the end of year two. So if you choose to exit the program at the end of the second year and say, I am going to just take a diploma, I'm not going to wait for the BSc uh, qualification. You have that option. You'll have to register for a project uh, in your fifth semester, uh, the summer term, uh, apart from the coursework for the four semesters. And you'll have to pay an additional fee for this particular project. So this uh, fee will be, uh, the, the fee amount for this will be uh, mentioned at the, at the start of that semester. Right. Uh, so I think uh, while this program was advertised, we did get a lot of queries about what the degree certificate uh, would look like. Uh, so what you're seeing on the screen is a representative sample of what your degree certificate from BITS, once you graduate this program, will look like. Uh, so this is on the front side of the certificate. On the rear side, on the back side of the certificate, as per regulations, uh, it will be mentioned that the mode of delivery is online. Okay, on the back side. Uh, on the front, this is uh, exactly what we'll see. I hope this uh, clarifies the doubts of a lot of applicants. So this basically brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, so we will now uh, do the Q&A session. So all the questions which have been posted in the uh, Q&A uh, box, uh, if you've not posted it there yet, please do that. And we'll try to answer all the questions uh, as much as possible in case we miss anything or if you have any specific questions, uh, depending on your situation, you can also write to us at this email ID, admissions at the rate online.bits-pilani.ac.in. All right, and we'll, we can answer it there as, as well. All right, so Professor Vimal, shall we take the questions? Yes, sir, yes, sir. So let me stop the sharing and uh, um, let's see what- May I look at some of the questions and answer? Sure, uh, sure, sure, uh, we can do that, yes. Um, before I actually start answering the questions, uh, there, were, there were a few, uh, Questions uh, stating their personal uh, qualifications or the work environment, and then they ask for uh, suggestions. 
So this personal cases, if you can actually reach out to you over email, we'll be able to help you better really. Okay. So with that, uh, let me go to uh, the question. This the very first question, how does BSC CS uh, is different from BTEC CS? This is a very good question. Uh, this is a very good question, right? Uh, when it comes to computer science, both BSC in computer science, B in computer science and engineering, right? So most of the, the major themes in computer science is actually very hard to actually put a line between here is where the science ends, here is where the engineering starts. For example, if you just look at a course like databases, right? It's common to discuss about, uh, you know, modeling, year diagrams, design, formal and mathematical representation notations that actually uses relational algebra and calculus. And slowly it actually moves on to topics which actually cuts through engineering. Okay. So only, you know, doing a science portion, skipping those engineering portion may not actually do justice. So whenever we actually do a course in BSc in computer science or in, in any program in BSc computer science, there would be some amount of engineering topics would, would actually be there. When it actually comes to offering a B in computer science, the balance of these engineering topics would actually be more. For example, if you actually look at, uh, look at you know, specifics in terms of courses, most of these computer science courses would actually have, uh, would actually have, uh, uh, most of these computer science programs would actually have courses in um, programming fundamentals, programming languages, data structures and algorithms, data structures, algorithms, complexity, operating systems. You know, these are these are subject areas where the emphasis should be higher for a science BSc, uh, particularly a BSc program. Emphasis has to be higher, and there would be topics where the emphasis has to be higher for a for a for a engineering degree. For example, architectures and organization. Uh, digital design, circuits and electronics, uh, and so on. So uh, if you just look at all the themes that are actually common across computer science and computer engineering, the emphasis of certain topics has to be pretty higher for computer science and certain topics has to be for, for, for computer engineering, the emphasis has to be higher on certain other places. So when we actually design a curriculum for computer science, we ensure that the emphasis are on the, on the right places, right places. For example, when it actually you know, come to formal languages, we actually have looked at the particular course uh, such a way that it actually is more relevant to a science program and then building systems and things like that are, are kept out. So, so in places where we actually can actually make a decision as to, okay, we need only this much of, we, we, we actually need to have a science emphasis which actually do justice to the program. We actually did that. In places where certain engineering aspects are inevitable, we ensured that we actually have covered this, uh, covered this uh, topics as a part of this engineering. So, so please be assured that uh, there is, there is a fundamental differences in the, in the, in the way that, uh, the way the BSc computer science and BE computer science programs are offered, the difference actually comes from the standpoint of where the emphasis on certain topics actually goes higher and lower. So this particular program has got courses that actually justifies science more. The balances are towards topics around science, but then there are engineering topics uh, which are necessary for the program, right? So, uh, so there is an overlap for sure for the one who asked the question, that's a good question. Okay. Um, will I be able to do a master's degree after this course? Uh, can I be eligible for MSc computer science after this? Yes, you will be eligible for, for a master. You can actually do MSc computer science. Every university have their own, uh, their own entry criterion and equivalence and so on. So you need to actually check with the universities. Uh, you need to actually check with the universities, but, this is a BSc degree program and you are eligible. Uh, from the BITS perspective, you are eligible to do a postgraduate degree or, or MSc degree program. Okay. Um, there is a question on uh, math qualifier exam. How do I prepare, where to prepare? The math qualifier exam comes with uh, a, a very detailed syllabus. This is an equivalent of, uh, equivalent of topics that are actually uh, from, uh, high secondary uh, math topics, certain topics curated for math topics. So uh, the detailed syllabus is actually available. The topics are actually quite common. The emphasis uh, on math qualifier is pretty stronger, pretty higher in calculus fundamentals. And then there is a 
there is there, there is an element of algebra. These topics are pretty common, um, and there will be a sample questions also to to, to let you know uh, about the level of uh, level of uh, complexity that's expected from the actual exam and so on. So I'm sure uh, there are plenty of materials of helpful online to, to cover these topics. They're, they're very, very fundamental in nature. And what will be the daily time commitment for completing these courses? Uh, weekly 24 hours is what we actually expect. Um, so if you're, so, so the, so the, so the first, first advice that I would like to give you on planning your daily timing is please be consistent. If you actually are giving, you know, at least two hours time every day, just give it regularly. And uh, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm really sure that at some point you would actually be feeling that, okay, this two hours is not sufficient in this week. I need to actually give a little more. So we give a little more time in the weekend. So uh, if you just do a simple math, you need to give about four hours a day, but then at least give two hours a day consistently and give a little more time in the weekends. That's what I would, um, if you have other commitments. Uh, what about labs and practical um, knowledge? There are courses, for example, programming courses like with programming laboratory. We would enable live, uh, sorry, lab sessions through Coursera labs or bits lab infrastructure. Uh, this depends on the tools. For example, if certain tools are actually available only with bits lab infrastructure, we would actually enable through bits lab infrastructure. If it's available through Coursera labs, we would actually enable it through Coursera labs. Uh, or if certain things are actually open source, we would actually be giving tutorials and we'll ensure that the practical aspects are actually covered. We, we, uh, we uh, are very uh, serious about ensuring that the practical aspects are actually getting covered rightly and uh, you train rightly in the right place, uh, right topics. Um, there's a question on uh, exit plan with diploma. I've discussed it. If you have any further questions, you can ask, ask me. Uh, so I've talked about how to connect with your batchmates. Are the classes conducted live or recorded? It's a blend of both. Predominantly, the classes are actually recorded. There are live sessions from two to four. Uh, these live sessions are also recorded. I understand that students are actually, learners are actually coming from different time zones. Uh, this is very difficult for everyone to make it, make it to the live sessions. But in case if you miss it, you actually can attend the recorded session and make, make it up for that. Are the live classes mandatory? Uh, we don't actually keep a track of who attends, who doesn't attend for the purpose of awarding marks or credits. Okay, from the learning perspective, you would always learn something when you are in a live class because you will be interacting with your uh, teacher. You would be following your fellow students, classmates, asking questions to the teacher and answering. So it's, it's a learning opportunity in that sense, it's actually mandatory, uh, but you can take it offline watch a recorded session not necessarily that you must uh, always be there for all the online sessions in case if there's a there's a requirement that's fine right how the semester exams are conducted we've actually answered this it's a proctored online exam we'll actually get to the details of the platform uh, and the technical aspects shortly uh, i'm a student uh, of 1970 uh, math physics chemistry uh, bsc student with math physics chemistry can they undertake the course? Answer is yes, for sure. Uh, can we pursue this course while, while doing uh, BTEC in civil engineering? There are a few other questions. Students actually pursue civil engineering, mechanical arts, and other students have asked for the same, same, same thing. Uh, presently, NEP actually allows it in India that you actually do a full-time degree and then do an online degree simultaneously. You actually can take it as long as you're, uh, you, you, you can actually balance the workload. Uh, and in case if you have any further, you know, consultation required, you can actually check with your institute also. See, can I actually do this? But technically, any NEP allows it uh, within India. Can we pursue multiple elective specialization courses beyond the established limit? Uh, the the number of electives, disciplinary electives, is four as as of now. Uh, it's, it's only four. Uh, there's no fifth elective that you actually can enroll. Uh, but there's a good question in the interest of learning. We'll actually look at this. Okay. So I want to know about four-year track and its criteria. Additional information on fourth years. Um, we 
we recognize uh, the need uh, of students of certain groups to have a fourth year degree, uh, a four year degree, uh, four year first degree uh, for employment, academic, and other purposes. Uh, we are working on uh, we are working on uh, the fourth year uh, degree option currently. We will let you know about the updates very shortly. Uh, and there are other questions again on uh, will I be eligible after doing this BSc for the fourth year extension? Answer is yes, obviously. In case if, if we actually roll out a fourth year, uh, you would be the first people who are who are eligible for this because it would be an extension of this three-year degree program. Uh, what would be the difficulty level of the course? As I'm 30 year old working as teacher, will this help me becoming a freelance in the IT sector? We are actually very sure about one aspect uh, about the program that it actually has the right kind of fundamentals that are necessary uh, to to be employable, right? And uh, I'm sure this is going to help you for sure. Can I learn AIML here? Uh, the program has got a couple of uh, courses now: uh, Introduction to Data Analytics, Data Visualization. These two courses can actually help you. Uh, a head start into uh, analytics. A formal course on AI and ML are not actually part of the first three year program. Uh, when we actually, I mentioned that we are actually working on a fourth year uh, extension, right? Uh, and, and you will actually find uh, a stronger emphasis on AI and ML there. Okay, so there's a question on in the works for your BS program. Uh, I've answered this. Okay. Does we uh, does we will have opportunity to choose our major subject? See, this program is a BSc in computer science program. The core is mandatory for all the electives. You have the freedom to choose. Particularly, there is a discipline elective. You have the freedom to choose. When it comes to the humanities or foundational elective, we may actually we may actually decide to offer only one instead two. But then, discipline elective. For sure, you have this. You have this option. Okay. Uh, is the BS approved? What are the chances of we being able to opt for BS? I've answered this. Uh, we will. We will reach out to you first uh, once we uh, complete this uh, four year fourth year extension, and in such cases, you would certainly be eligible. Right. Please abide our communication. Who will be able to apply BSc honors? This is this is actually envisaged as an extension to uh, to the three year degree program that you are enrolled that you are enrolled or you are enrolling for. Um, you would obviously be uh, eligible. Right? So, uh, will we get counseling for choosing the correct track? So whenever you actually have uh, any clarification required, any support required, or you want a discussion, please please reach out to the patients or, or the email ID that the operations actually shares with you. Uh, the right one of us would actually be in touch with you, help you with your uh, learning needs. Okay, what grading system? It is relative grading system. In the application development track, there is an elective course, user interface design. Which is not there as elective courses list is that missed out? Answer is yes. In the uh, in the in the track, you have only human computer interaction and uh, designing multimodal interfaces. These two courses covers the aspects um, aspects that we actually planned out in uh, user interface design. Please please ignore that title. Right. Thank you for the one who raised the question uh, and pointing this out. Okay, so I have, uh, I've answered a few questions. Uh, may I ask Ajit to answer some of the operational question? Absolutely, Professor. Vamont. You are on a streak, so I <laughs> let you <laughs> do that. Uh, so let me look at that. Uh, what questions are there from an operational aspect? Uh, and I'll try to answer this. Uh, so one uh, question that uh, we're seeing being repeated is whether this degree has the same value as a normal bits degree. Um, and will the uh, certificate be a hard copy? Will it be a regular certificate? Uh, and questions which are of a similar nature. 
So I've already showed you the, uh, in my presentation, I've showed you a sample of the certificate. So this is going to be a hard copy, which will be sent to you by post after you graduate. On the back side of the certificate, as per the regulations, we will be mentioning that the mode of delivery is online. It won't be mentioned on the front side. And this is an online degree. And if there was, there was a notification from UGC recently, which uh, basically indicated that degrees which are offered by recognized institutes and universities, either in distance mode or online mode will be considered equivalent to on-campus degree. So this is a notification that has come from the government itself. So uh, there is no reason we see that uh, this will be, uh, you're gonna have a problem with this. This is treated as a normal bits degree itself. Uh, another question that uh, is also fairly common is, I'm already doing another degree or I'm planning to do another degree in parallel with this one. So is that allowed? So the uh, answer is yes. Uh, again, as for the government regulations, you are allowed to pursue two programs simultaneously in any mode. So you can have one in regular campus mode, one in online, you can have both running online or you can have both running on campus. So it doesn't matter which mode it is, you are allowed to pursue two programs simultaneously. The government has allowed this, so you can do that. Uh, another type of uh, question that we are seeing is uh, regarding the uh, job opportunities post-graduation and uh, whether you will get the same opportunities as the students on campus and will there be placement assistance at the end of the degree? Uh, so uh, first of all, the uh, on-campus placement is a slightly different thing, which basically handles. So we are not going to be able to club both of these together. So the online degree is going to be separate and the on-campus is separate in terms of placement. However, uh, if you look at it from a job opportunity or a placement perspective, uh, so we look at it from uh, three points. The first is uh, the curriculum itself has been designed uh, for this particular program in consultation with industry. So I think Professor Vimal has already explained. Uh, so we've commissioned a large survey with uh, several companies and industry professionals to understand what are the skill sets that are required by the industry and this program has been designed keeping that in mind so as soon as you graduate you are already uh, job ready so to speak so in terms of placement that's one point uh, the second thing is um, apart from the technical skills there are also several other soft skills which are required uh, for placement it could be uh, you know help with uh, how to appear for interviews, how to uh, build your resume, you know, how to answer questions. So those kind of soft skills, I think, uh, so uh, you will get access uh, to uh, support in those areas also as, pa as part of the program. So that will be also provided. So that's point number two. And point number three is for uh, graduates uh, of this program who are based in India, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, basically uh, giving them opportunities. Uh, we're trying to generate opportunities with uh, industry uh, for the students who are based in India for this of, uh, of this program. And uh, we're going to try to get them uh, evaluated by the uh, industry and uh, check. So, so that effort is actually happening on that end as well right now. So I think these are the three points that I'd like to mention in terms of uh, placement uh, assistance for the program. Okay, uh, another question that I'm seeing is, uh, can we join this program if I've done a diploma and not the 12? So while the eligibility criteria clearly says that you need to have completed a class 12th or equivalent, um, we understand that there are several types of 
other qualifications which are there uh two year diploma three year diploma and many other things so it would be very hard for us to give an answer looking at it case by case so my advice here is please submit your application there is no uh, application fee involved so submit your application with all your certificates and our admissions team is going to look at your certificates and uh, make a decision uh, based on the regulations whether you will be considered eligible uh, for the for apply for entry into the program okay okay another question that we're seeing is can we visit the bits pilani campus for cultural events or fests and can we uh, visit the campus uh, will the guards let us in um, so questions like that so yes you are students of bits pilani so you uh, definitely will be able to uh, come to any of the campuses for any of the campus fest uh, there's no problem i think you should be able to uh, come without any problem and uh, if if you uh, so there were some questions about coming to a campus to meet with faculty so i think you will have to connect to the faculties uh, beforehand and in in case they agree uh, uh, that there is some merit in meeting you there so i think that can be also done uh, okay another uh, another common question is are are there any fee waivers or scholarships available uh so at this point in time so we are not offering any uh, scholarships or fee waivers for this program and uh, we are there are no uh, uh so you don't have the ability to do uh, credit transfers also so i think there's a subset of questions asking about uh, whether they they can transfer credits from uh, something that they they've done previously or something that they're doing right now so uh, you will not get any course waivers so you have to complete all the courses that are specified in this program so there's no credit transfers available and uh, no scholarships available at this time uh, so there's one question which asked is the is the a year to build startups uh valid for this program so uh i think this particular uh phrase uh, is in uh, rel is in in the context of on campus programs uh which follows a fairly rigid uh structure so students typically can't take breaks in between so they have to complete the program uh, in a particular pattern whereas uh we are already giving you uh, the flexibility to complete this uh program in 6 years so definitely if you want to take a break in between to pursue other activities you can do that and you can come back and resume where you left off uh however uh, please note all the points that are mentioned earlier in regards to completing the program within 3 years 4 years or later so what are the fee implications you should be aware of that Uh, another question that we are seeing is whether this degree is accepted by other universities or other institutions or employers so bits is a very uh, old institution and we uh, so we've ne never seen uh, uh, our degrees that we've uh, uh, issued out in the past have wide acceptance everywhere both uh, within india as well as internationally Uh, so there's no reason to say that why this particular degree is not going to be accepted so this is going to this is considered equivalent uh, to an on campus degree with bits and you have government regulations also which uh, make the which clearly say that uh, the uh, certificate uh, the online degrees are equivalent to on, off campus so i think uh, i don't think there is a there is any reason to be worried on this part part Okay, so okay there is a couple of questions about the maths qualifier examination uh, so i can just reiterate uh, what i had covered earlier so in case you do not meet the maths uh, qualifying requirement which is basically uh, you should have scored 60% or higher in your class 12th or high school qualification or equivalent uh, so if you have not scored if you uh, if you scored higher than 60% then you are directly eligible you don't have to write the qualifier examination 
in case you haven't taken mathematics or if you scored less than 60% or less than uh, the grade point of six out of 10, uh, then uh, our admissions team will uh, inform you that you need to take the qualifier examination. You'll be sent a link where you can register for it and uh, select an exam slot and uh, give the examination. This is a completely online examination of two hours duration. And I think there's going to be 40 questions in it. Uh, it's a multiple choice type of uh, exam. And again, it's not a hard exam. It's just going to test you for basic prerequisites. Uh, we are not here to restrict people from joining. We just want to make sure that you have the sufficient knowledge to be able to join and participate and complete the program successfully. The qualifying examination needs to be completed prior to your admission. You, once, once you take the examination and you clear it, only after that uh, your uh, application will be processed further and you'll be offered the provisional admission depending on your other documentation. How will we connect with other batch mates? Uh, so once you get admission to the program, you'll get your uh, bits IDs. You'll also get uh, account set up on Slack. Uh, so Slack is going to be your uh, communication portal with other, uh, your batch mates, you know, as well as uh, I mean, the course mates. Okay, so I think, so there is going to be an orientation course, uh, which is going to be set up on Coursera. And uh, as soon as your admission is completed, once you get your IDs, uh, you will be enrolled in that orientation course and a lot of these details will be covered there. So you can go through that. All right, Professor Vimal. Uh, so I can uh, review some of these questions, uh, which are pertaining to academics um, and uh, yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. All right. Let me look at a few more questions. Uh, are the con classes conducted live or recorded? Uh, so the live sessions will be conducted live. And in case uh, you're not able to join it, the recording is also going to be available and shared with you in the course. Also for the mathematics qualifier examination, if you look at the, uh, the course page that we, the uh, application page that we have on Coursera, the details of the maths examination is mentioned there, including the syllabus and including uh, the requirements that are, uh, that you need in order to take it, the IT requirements, et cetera. So the link is there, please go there and check it. So semester exams will be conducted in an online mode. It's online proctored exam uh, on a technology platform. Will we be given access to any other learning platforms uh, with our ID? Uh, so the way the courses have been designed, we have tried to, uh, to keep it completely self-contained. So a lot of the material, the videos, the readings, everything is designed so that you get all your information within the course itself. And at present, we have not assessed the need for students to uh, get access to something else uh, for additional material. So it is still being assessed. I mean, if, if we feel the need that uh, this is required, then uh, definitely uh, we will look into it. Uh, when do the classes start? So uh, we're planning to start tentatively. It's going to start on November 30th. That will be the first day of uh, classes for the first semester. Uh, what grading system will be applied? I think this is already mentioned earlier. We are using relative grading in the courses. 
and uh, letter grades will be given uh, based on your score, like A, A minus B, B minus things like that. Uh, is there any age limit for admission into this course? Uh, no, there is no age limit here. Uh, uh, if uh, people from uh, any age can apply. Uh, will it be necessary to attend daily classes? So there are no daily classes here. So all the video content for the course will be available to you on Coursera as pre-recorded content itself. Uh, within certain courses, there may be uh, up to uh, three or four live sessions, which will be conducted based on the instructor's uh, uh, assessment. Uh, okay, so we're getting some questions related to when the decision will be made for uh, acceptance into this degree. Uh, we understand that uh, uh, a lot of students have applied uh, from the early uh, application deadline itself. And uh, we are actually going through the uh, applications that we have received. Um, so, and especially considering the deadline is approaching, we are getting a lot of applications and our admissions team is under severe pressure to uh, quickly process the application. So it is actually ongoing right now. Uh, and you should expect to uh, hear from us very soon. So please be patient for a few more days. Uh, is there a minimum CGPA or grade required uh, for graduation? Uh, yes, that is correct. I've mentioned it earlier. So you need to have a CGPA 4.5 or higher in order to qualify for graduation. Okay, so there's one question which says, uh, uh, when we start taking elective courses, you, uh, by that time you would be uh, completed all the core courses for all the tracks. Uh, the answer is yes. As per the pattern that was shared, uh, if you follow that pattern, uh, that is correct. Okay, let me see some of uh, the other questions. Yes, it says that uh, the candidates from the program can join the uh, BITS Alumni Association. Uh, yes, that is correct. So uh, upon graduation from the program, you will be an alumni of BITS Pilani and you'll be able, you'll, you can join the BITS Alumni Association and all the benefits that uh, come uh, with there. So I think they do a lot of networking events and things like that will be happening. Uh, so the details of that can be posted, will be shared with you. Uh, we're also seeing some questions which are very specific to individuals saying that I have uh, a certain qualification and uh, am I eligible for this particular program? So my general advice in all of these cases is uh, please apply with your highest level of qualification that you have. So we are looking at a class 12 certificate as the minimum required. So if you have a class 12 certificate, please apply with that itself. In case you don't have a class 12, or if you have an alternate or if you have a higher certificate, you can apply with that. If you have a class 12, please apply with the class 12 certificate itself. So it makes it very easy for us to evaluate and give the admission in that case.
there is one question can we uh, complete the bachelor's degree uh, two or three years later uh, if we exit using a diploma in the second year can we come back and do complete the bachelor's degree later so i i don't think that would be possible because this particular program you need to complete the uh, the program within six years that's one thing and secondly uh, in the fifth semester registration you'll basically be asked do you want to complete do you want to go ahead and complete the bachelor's degree as as per the normal plan or do you want to exit if you want to exit you're going to get the uh, option to register for the mini project so at that point you will have to make a decision as to how you want to proceed so there's one there's a few questions which say would universities abroad recognize this degree on par with other regular degrees so as i've mentioned earlier so bits degrees have worldwide acceptance so many of our students are uh, studying abroad uh, in various universities so the bits pilani brand and the degree has a wide acceptance uh, so again uh, the government has also indicated that online degrees are equivalent to on campus and bits pilani is an institution of eminence and uh, this particular recognition allows us to design and uh, offer uh, programs uh, which are uh, which don't need separate certification from ugc or aict so just having the institution of eminence allows us uh, to do that uh, so given all these factors there is no reason to uh, from for us to say that uh, uh, there's going to be any problem with this particular degree however uh, we'd also like to emphasize that accepting any degree is the prerogative of uh, the receiving university or an employer so it is up to them uh, as to what criteria they are following however from a general standpoint there is no differentiation that we see uh okay so there's a related question so there are people who have completed who've been given the provisional offers and uh, uh they've completed all the uh, remaining uh, documentation and fee payment uh so again the admission team is working to complete the evaluation of your documents and as soon as we do that your ids will be issued out and uh, you will get notified about that uh, you'll have to wait for another another week or so all right so as i said so we're receiving a lot of applications particularly because the deadline is approaching uh, so the admission team has to juggle between trying to process the people in the queue and the new people who are coming in all right so i think uh, we've covered uh, most of the uh, uh, questions uh in the in the topic all right let me see in the q and a if i can see something which is recent uh So what's the difference between the early application and the application deadline so the application deadline is november 15th so which will be the last date uh, because the classes are expected to start on november 30th so we can't uh, keep accepting admissions for this particular batch uh, there would be a next cohort which will likely start in july or august of next year uh, so in case students are not able to make it for this they can uh, definitely apply for that yes uh, uh will we get books or other materials for the course so uh, as mentioned earlier so the content in the course is designed to be uh, self contained 
and uh, while we recommend textbooks for all the courses as professor vimal mentioned there is a rigor there's an academic rigor involved in referring to textbooks and learning from books so we want to maintain that uh, however the, the purchase of the books the either the physical books or ebooks is uh, the student has to do it by themselves just like in a normal college Okay, so there's another question which says that uh, again, this is something which which I've covered earlier that uh, someone is doing another program in parallel. So uh, as I said, so this particular program, uh, if you're following the normal workload, will require about 25 hours per week. So uh, from a government regulation standpoint, you can pursue two courses in parallel. Uh, now we are also giving you the flexibility that you can reduce the course load you can say uh, instead of six courses i want to do three courses or four courses uh, you, you have the flexibility to do that so that will reduce your uh, uh, courses uh, the, the number of hours per week that you will be required so depending on what your situation is and how many hours you can devote to it you can customize uh, the particular program but you'll need to Note that there might be a fee implication if you're not completing the course within four years. If, if your course exceeds beyond four years, you may have to pay additionally. Uh, the next cohort is likely to be in July and August. So. Uh, the admission details for that will again come up on Coursera maybe uh, end of December or January. So I think you'll have to wait for that to see. Uh, so if you've received the offer letter on 27th October, uh, you are required to complete the processes within uh 10 working days i think uh you're almost coming towards the end of that so please do that at the earliest okay uh i don't think you can uh, delay until 30th november i don't think that's a try so we are going to have cutoffs uh way before that i think uh so admission cell is going is also checking who has paid the fees who's completed all the documentation. So if you're not going to complete that before uh, they check it, then it is likely that your provisional offer will get declined. All right, so uh, since you you applied early, you, you got the thing, I think you should be able to make the payment. Uh, since this is an online mode, we do not have any seat constraints under normal situation. So there's no seat limit. We're only looking at very uh, general eligibility criteria. So if you meet that criteria, you should be able to get in. As I've covered it before, you should have completed your class 12. You should meet your, the English requirements and the mathematics requirements. You can apply now, the uh, admissions are still ongoing. Uh, the deadline for applications is 15th November. So please make sure you can go in there, start your application, fill out the details and submit your documents. If you apply now before 15th, uh, you should be able to uh, get admission into this cohort itself. Uh, in terms of placement, I've already mentioned it earlier. So the campus placement unit is separate. Okay, so we're not going to be able to merge this online program with the on-campus placements. Uh, however, uh, there are three points to consider. One is the curriculum is geared uh, strongly towards uh, getting the jobs in the industry. 
uh, you're also going to get career support in terms of uh, soft skills. And third is for students who are graduating this program and are based in India, we are looking at uh, generating opportunities for them uh, with industry and getting industry to evaluate uh, their performance or their profiles. So these are the three aspects in terms of placement. Uh, after submitting your final documents, I think it will take about 10 days or 15 days to get your ID or email uh, account. All right, it might happen earlier also. Uh, please be patient. Uh, there are no internships associated with this program. The next uh, batch in July, uh, so likely to be in July, August. Uh, that's when it will likely to start. And I think the admission will pro probably open by uh, end of the year or maybe uh, the beginning of next year. On the same on the same page on Coursera. Um, is it guaranteed that I will get a seat in this program? So I think it depends on your qualifications. So please apply and the admissions team is going to look at it. And if you meet the eligibility criteria, there's no reason why you would be denied any admission. Uh, is it better to do this as a standalone degree or along with another degree? So, uh, so we don't have any particular recommendation. It really depends on your personal uh, situation and your personal capacity. Uh, if you have the ability to do two programs together, uh, you're welcome to uh, continue that. Uh, you also have the option to uh, place this out at a lower uh, number of courses. You can do that as well, or you can do it standalone. So I think the decision has to be yours on this. Uh, we do not offer any premium Coursera subscriptions with this uh, particular program. Uh, so we've got a query saying does WES recognize this degree. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so BITS degrees are widely accepted in the US. Uh, so this degree also, there's no reason for us to believe it won't be. Uh, it's from BITS Pilani, it's an online thing. And uh, I think it meets all the criteria uh, of WES. I think uh, it, should, it should be uh, acceptable. What is the deadline to pay the fees for the first semester? So you would have received an, uh, a provisional offer letter. So you have to complete the process within 10 days from the date of receipt of that provisional offer letter. Uh, do we need a laptop for this course? Uh, uh, you do not need a laptop, but you definitely need a system. It could be a desktop or a laptop. 
some IT system is required. Uh, so there are, uh, since this is an online program, you will need the system, internet connection, webcam. So all those requirements are uh, mentioned. So make sure you have that uh, uh, because apart from uh, attending the classes, you'll also require it while taking the uh, online proctored exams. All right, I think we've exceeded our uh, uh, time limit. So we answered most of the questions for the ones uh, uh, that we were not able to address. Please write to us at All right, so I've given the email ID in the chat box, admissions at the rate online.bits-pilani.ac.in. So if you have any specific questions which we did not cover here, you can write to us there and we'll be able to respond to you. All right, I think we're already half an hour beyond our uh, scheduled time. Uh, all right, thank you uh, to everyone who's joined once again. Thank you for taking time out and joining us. And uh, if you've not yet applied, uh, I hope this uh, webinar helped clear some of your doubts and uh, you'll proceed to apply uh, before the deadline of 15th November. So please make sure you apply before that. And for those who have already applied, I hope we were able to give you some insights into the program and clarifications on some of your doubts. Uh, all right. Thank you very much and have a good Sunday.